But yes, it's a pleasure to talk to you all today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by patterns in space and time. Um, and that's really what's driven me to study collective behavior. Um, and, you know, even though I come from a, a biology background, you know, I dropped mathematics when I was 15 years old, which was one of my biggest regrets later in life. Um, theory has a, a become a, a really important part of understanding pattern formation. And so theory can come in different flavors. For example, simulations like this that can capture many of the details of systems. But as I'll argue today, a very important aspect is to be able to use other mathematical tools to be able to abstract and generalize, to find commonalities or differences between systems um, that may appear to be so different that they don't deserve comparison. But I will argue today that indeed they do. Theory is, is fun to work with, but it's not so useful without experiments. And so I'll also present experiments both within the laboratory and also increasingly within the natural environment using new tools such as deep learning technologies. Um, and these detailed types of data, of course, allow opportunities for new types of visualization and analysis of these types of complex data. And so our work tries to integrate all of these aspects. So what drives me? Well, I've always been interested in computation. I've always been interested in how we make sense of the world. And there's a lot of people who study the individual brain, but what's much less studied is collective computation, how interactions between brains give rise to higher order forms of intelligence. So I want to go back and forth between these different levels of description today. So because we're interested in principles, we literally study the full spectrum of the complexity of animals on our planet, from the simplest multicellular organism, this fascinating creature, Placozoa, it's in its own phylum at the base of the, the metazoan tree. And it doesn't have neurons, despite the fact it has the full complement of neurotransmitters. And so the neurotransmitters evolved prior to neurons. If you look at the the density of the nuclei of this organism, or if you look at the, um, the direction in which the cells are moving at a moment in time here, encoded by color, it looks a bit like a fish school or a bird flock. The local interactions among the cells give rise to higher order properties. And in this work, we were able to show that this local communication, even if it's tuned to at criticality, I'll come back to what that means later on, um, it's still, imposes limits on how large these organisms can be and they're forced to divide by fission if they get too large, which gives us insights into the evolution of hierarchical systems, such as neuronal systems in uh, the evolution of larger organisms. Elsewhere in the natural world, Nigel Franks was mentioned, my PhD advisor, he worked on army ants and I followed in this, uh, looking at these blind individuals, it's the blind leading the blind, here you can see them interlocking their bodies in a time-lapse movie as the gap grows, allowing the colony to cross the gap. And then on the right, we discover this new form of structure called scaffolding, which allows them to help the other members of the colony take food back to the nest in very uh, difficult uh, habitat. We also use a variety of tools such as biomimetic robotics, because if we want to understand the hydrodynamic interactions between individuals, for example, we don't, despite having supercomputers, we still can't solve these equations. And so we use biomimetic robotics to develop theory, how fish could in principle save energy. And then we can test this theory directly with the real animals. And this is termed vortex phase matching, this new theory we developed. And the computational tools also such as deep learning allow us to track very large numbers of individuals, but not only to track them, these deep neural networks can be trained to effectively learn exactly who is whom, even though they've got no markings. So no human could tell the difference between these termites, yet the software readily can. And the software is agnostic to study systems such as these mice. Again, no human can determine the difference, but it's very easy for these, or, or this Drosophila, for example, 
uh, it's very easy for the software to know who is whom. So we developed these tools for visualization and analysis, and they're all free and open source. And what this allows us to do is to look at this hallmark of collective behavior. So suddenly we can now track the individuals. We can look at how information flows through the system. And so the turning of one or a few individuals can lead to the social contagion through the group. We can also reconstruct the pathways of light onto the retina. So using ray casting algorithms. So we can reconstruct, for example, for one focal individual here, the left visual field in red and the right visual field in blue. And you can see that this is a complex time varying scene driven both by self motion and also the motion of others around. And yet, like all organisms, the brain has to take in this high dimensional sensory information and reduce that complexity down into a series of low level movement decisions, which in fish is actually a relatively small number of neurons in the reticular spinal formation. And so by understanding this visual information, I should highlight the fish we use um, have a very limited lateral line system, at least not, not the ones we used for studying hydrodynamics, but the ones I'll talk about for the rest of the talk today, predominantly use vision. They do not use hydrodynamics to coordinate their motion. And so these tools allow us to reconstruct the salient sensory information. And so we can work out of all the visual features they could pay attention to, which ones are actually correlated with changes of behavior. And then we can reconstruct these hidden networks of interaction. Because if you want to understand individual intelligence, I mean, this is really inspired by neuroscience. If you want to understand individual intelligence, you can go into the brain and you can look at the physical and the functional connectivity of neuronal networks and how that gives rise to decision. If we're interested in collective decisions between animals, well, there is no physical form. So we need these new tools to reconstruct visual fields, work out what they're paying attention to, and then reconstructing these quantitative networks of interaction where these edges don't represent who's close to whom. They actually represent the probabilities of changing behavior dependent on the specific information, visual information, which might be time integrated, that they're utilizing. And so the weight of these networks is important. The direction is important because like many social networks, um, I might be strongly influenced by you, but you not by me. So we can have directed interactions. And this is a real fish school, visualizing these networks for the first time. And we find that they're not scale free. They're not small world. They're in their own network class, which actually, you know, maybe not surprising because they've been under massive selection pressure for millennia. They're in their own network class that has remarkable properties that allow them to convey information very quickly through the network while minimizing local correlations. And so there's much we can learn from these types of groups, in my opinion. And so while of course the brain is an important, an essential component for information uh, and computation, we also find in a, a series of studies that I don't have time to go into details about today, that computation is also an emergent property of the structure of the network, the topology and the weights and the directiveness of these networks as manipulated by the animals. So for example, in terms of regulating social contagion or modulating uh, response to increased risk. So we would naturally think, if you think of a sort of drift diffusion type model with a, a threshold, we naturally think for an individual animal, if the world becomes more risky, it may reduce that threshold, thus the drift diffusion reaches a decision more quickly at the cost perhaps of accuracy. But when we start thinking about a network of brains together making this decision, in actual fact, what we find is that they do not do that. If anything, they move the threshold away. And so each individual becomes less sensitive to inputs, which seems counterintuitive. But what they do, that reduces false, uh, false alarms. What they do is they fundamentally change the topology of the network structure. Because remember, each brain is connected to the other brains. And so if any individual responds, it's much more likely to lead to a wave of response through the system. So they reduce false alarms and they um, exaggerate through uh, information via this emergent 
property. In terms of sensing long-range environmental gradients, we found that the individuals themselves were not capable of doing this at all. They don't integrate in space or time. Yet we found that the collective was incredibly effective. And as groups got bigger, they got more effective. And we discovered that that again was due to the network properties. So this sounds perhaps to, to those of you from an evolutionary background, a little bit counterintuitive because these animals are genetically of very low relatedness. It's not like the ants I showed you before. So surely this sounds a bit too much like group selection, but we've also taken great care to show that such emergent properties, this sort of physical intelligence readily evolves among genetically purely selfish individuals. So despite the great differences in these systems, the computation is really modulated to a large degree by changing the weights and the connectivity of the connections between the elements of the system, which is much more akin to how neuroscientists have thought about computation over the last uh, decades. And so I think that's you know, why I'm so delighted to be able to talk to a neuroscience audience today. So I'm gonna show you some pretty old work now, but it's only so I can set the scene for some work that we're now doing to understand the brain uh, later on. And so the idea here is we were interested in leadership and decision-making. And I'm showing you these nice pictures of fish from Matt McHenry, but we can, as I'll show you later, I give you data from, from primates. We can think of very broad types of groups. These models are very generic and kind of universal. And we were interested in how did these grouping animals make informed, unanimous decisions regarding where to go? So for example, fish you know, do not have this eight second memory span or 30 second memory span. People think they've got amazing memories. They can remember very quickly and for months or years. But do individuals with information need to signal this is the direction in which we should go? Do others need to recognize who is information and who does not? And so what we assumed at the time and I'll show you, um, and maybe many of you know that this is actually how the brain does operate. Um, but uh, it was an assumption at the time that the brain must have some sort of internal vectorial representation of preferences, of a directional preference regarding where to go. Of course, we now know that that is the case. Um, and also there are social vectors pointing towards, egocentric vectors pointing towards other individuals. And that's all we assume in the model that the informed individuals are reconciling this social vectors with the goal-oriented vector, and that the uninformed individuals just have the social vectors, i.e. the goal-oriented vector has a length of zero. And if we just assume those very simple interactions, and we have individuals starting at random positions and random orientations, and the colors are just so we know who is information, so no one can read the mind of anyone else, the white individuals here have a common directional preference, and the big green cross just shows you the centroid of the group, then we find that the information can be conveyed very quickly without requiring individual recognition or signaling. And if we conduct experiments with real fish, the red ones are informed, the blue are uninformed, trained to a green laser stimulus, you can see this wave of propagation. And as we predicted in our theory, the accuracy of information transfer increases asymptotically as a function of the number of individuals with information. So, so far, all of the individuals have been in agreement with respect to where to go. But just as in the brain that must make decision between multiple options, we also deal with the case where different groups or subgroups, I should say, of individuals have different directional preferences. How then does the system come to a consensus when no individual has the ability to count? And so it turns out that it's what's important to the number of individuals with different preferences. So that's like the, the number of neurons in a system, the strength of those preferences, which is analogous to the firing rate, but also in, in this case, the geometrical difference, which is also true of some neuronal systems. So here we have, um, excuse me, five versus five, in a group of 100. Now, one group is always going to want to go zero degrees. That's the lower dotted line. The other group disagrees with them. It may disagree by a small amount towards the left of the graph, 10, 20, 30 degrees, or to the right-hand side, 180 degrees, 
where they want to go in exactly opposite directions. So what happens here? Well, below a critical difference of opinion, despite the inability to count, and the white line, the solid white line, shows you if they were to be able to perfectly integrate all of the vectors, if they could do perfect mathematics, that's where they would go as the average preference. Well, you can see they can approximate that really well. But if you imagine the, the red target is to the left and the green target is to the right, well, as they move towards those targets, the angle will slowly increase. And the model predicts that at a critical point, the system suddenly switches from compromise to decision-making. And if there's an equal number with equal preference strength, then it's 50-50 which way the group goes. This is not the group splitting. This is just the probability of the whole group going one way or the other. And so here you can see an, an equal number here. It's actually 10 versus 10. And it's going to be random which option they choose. In this example, they choose red. And of course, the, the green ones, the uninformed ones, could become informed. They could learn and so forth. But what if we add just one extra individual to one of these groups? So they start at random positions, random orientations. No individual knows if anyone agrees with them or disagrees with them. They suddenly don't know if they're in a majority or a minority. And so here we have six as a lower dotted line versus five. And what we find now is below that critical difference of opinion, below that critical angle, they do exactly the same. They're very good at spontaneously finding the average preference, even though no one knows what those preferences are and no one can count. But when they reach that critical bifurcation, they will now almost always go in the majority preferred direction, 99% of the time. And you can even see in the simulation the sort of local noisy nature of the interactions. And yet the highly, highly effective computational capabilities of individuals that start at random positions. Now, if individuals are really unwilling to give up on their preferences, if the strength of preferences is very strong, we do enter a regime where they can no longer come to consensus. But I won't talk about that today. In a very large sway, the parameter space, they make decisions together. And that's what we typically see in nature. Now, um, when I wrote the paper, I was kind of rushed by the editors. And I sort of thought, you know, I wrote it almost like, isn't it amazing? that they can make these very sensitive collective decisions um, as an emergent property, uh, despite all of those uninformed individuals. And only I, I realized later was that it's not despite the uninformed individuals, it's because of the uninformed individuals. And in fact, in, in the figure on the left there, if the minority has a very strong preference, such as the red line, where they have the strongest preference, then they can dominate decision-making. They can get their own way by having strong preferences. But if you add 10 or 15 uninformed individuals, it spontaneously returns control to the majority. I, it democratizes decision-making. And we tested this with schools of fish. Just by adding five or 10 uninformed individuals, we could change control from the, sort of the, the extremist minority to the majority. And when we worked on this, I started getting interested in whether this was not just of relevance for, for groups of animals, maybe it's also of relevance for groups of people. Um, and so we, in the, in the paper, we also had models of human dynamics suggesting this is the case. And Nick Christakis had a follow-up paper in Nature that showed indeed humans have a similar type of behavior in certain uh, collective decision. But I also got interested around that time in trying to think about neuronal systems. And I was inspired by Bill Bialik, who, who was at Princeton, the same place I was at the time, who was working on uh, with Ella Schneidman on, on spin system models and connecting that to data from the cortex. And so we applied this to these spin systems, whereby some spins have a preference for one option, i.e. to be up, some spins have a preference for another option, i.e. to be down, and we can change the strength of those preferences and then have uninformed spins, spins that are integrated in the circuit, but don't care if they're up or down. And what we find was that these unbiased spins allowed the system to reach consensus, magnetization in the context of ferrous magnetic systems, but uh, to reach consensus more effectively. And not only that, 
just at the point where the system was most effective at making a collective decision, there was a massive drop in the time taken to make decisions. So this really got me started to get interested in the brain about how these, I mean, I, I, I mean, this is, I, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I mean, it seems that when neuroscientists record from systems, if, the, for example, the cells are not tuned, they kind of ignore them. They just look at the cells that are giving them what they perceive as, as, as good data. Whereas this would argue that in actual fact, having uninformed, untuned cells participating in the circuit should give rise to faster, more effective uh, decisions. And you know, the alternative is that you allow each cell to be really good at what it does. You build a really accurate circuit. Well, that's really hard for natural selection and very costly. This would argue that just let the system be noisy and counterintuitively adding more noise by uninformed individuals spontaneously makes the system super fast and super accurate. And so, you know, when I wrote this paper, I was really cautious about the potential connection between collective intelligence and collective behavior in animal groups and to neuronal systems. Surely the components are too different. Surely any analogy is just an analogy, it's just a metaphor. Well, I think I was wrong. I think in actual fact, there are fundamental principles of computation that do extend beyond these systems. And that's what I want to go into in the rest of today's talk, including some published and some unpublished work. So can I connect this neural collective and the collective of animals in some way? So how do neural collectives make decisions? Well, it's kind of ridiculous. I'm talking to a bunch of neuroscientists that know infinitely more than I do about this, but I got very interested in, in, in work related to spatial decision-making because all animals must make decisions on the move at some point in their lives. And there's been really remarkable work, inspiring work over the last decade with model organisms in particular, um, Drosophila, zebrafish, um, mammals, including macaques and rodents and bats that really inspired me, such as the work of Vivek Jaryamen and others that you know, looked at the ellipsoid body in the Drosophila brain and showed this, this torus, literal torus structure with this activity bump representing the, the consensus preference of the organism. The work of the Moses and others and especially that of Nakam Olonovsky, that really shows this vectorial representation um, towards other individuals and, and some very exciting um, work there. And so I got interested in you know, whether you know, this thinking about these animal collectors could in any way give some insights into these groups. And also it was very, it's very difficult to work with fish schools and bird flocks. The brain tends to stay together um, and and it's it's a bit easier to understand consensus decisions if that's the case. And earlier I showed you that just adding one individual to one of those subsets dramatically changed the decision making. It broke the symmetry even in these noisy systems. Now that's an example of, or an indication of of a phase transition, a sudden transition from the averaging to the decision making. Now when we have that sudden transition it's perhaps indicative of ultra sensitivity, which I'll come back to in a moment. Now, if, we have, if we're thinking about trying to find this type of bifurcation in the brain experimentally, well, then we need to control precisely the world because anything like a slight odor gradient or wind gradient or light gradient in my lab that I'm not aware of, but the animal is, will break the symmetry and I will never see a bifurcation in the brain. And so to address this, we developed holographic virtual reality for animals, because in virtual reality, we can control for rotational symmetry and so on. And so this uses uh, an old illusion called an anamorphic illusion, but it's so strong that I can tell you right now that this tape does not have a volume above the table. And yet your brain believes it too, and the illusion will shortly be broken. So it never had a volume. But if it's put back roughly into the right position, it will pop back into 3D. And so if we can fool humans in this way, the shoe also doesn't have any three-dimensional nature above the table. If we can fool humans in this way, we thought surely we can fool animals. If we track the eyes of the animals, we can then have the animal fully immersed in arbitrarily complex virtual environments. And that's exactly what we do 
So we developed a range of different systems, including for zebrafish, where we track the animals in 3D with multiple cameras at 100 hertz. And this is sped up uh, from, this is a tiny little zebrafish, less than a centimeter long. And it looks weird to the left, but it's, it's the same projection 100 times per second that you saw with the tape and with the shoe, such that from the fish's perspective, it appears volumetric within the tank. And the fish will tend to avoid it, even though there's nothing there. We also created virtual fish, virtual zebrafish. And here you can see a virtual fish swimming with the orange trajectory in a simple circle, and the real zebrafish believing it to be in the full volume of the tank with it, even though the projection surface is only the surface of the tank. Now, one limitation, so here are our virtual reality systems here in Constance. One limitation is I can never put more than one individual into that tank. Because remember when the paper was moved even slightly, the illusion was suddenly broken. That means from the perspective of a second individual, it would look rubbish. It will only look good for one individual. But what we can do and what we have done is we network these systems together. So the individual in the nearmost tank can interact directly with a holographic representation of the individual in the second and the third tank and vice versa. And not only that, we're building 15 of these at the moment and we can then control the network of communication. We can introduce time lags and so forth. Also in virtual reality, time doesn't need to be continuous. Space doesn't need to be Euclidean. We can play around with these aspects of geometry and space and time. And so here you can see two individuals interacting, not in the same physical world, but in the same virtual world. And we call this the matrix, um, a similar principle to used in the movie. And Liang Li, who was a postdoc and now a group leader in our department, has taken incredible care to show that two fish interacting in the matrix, the way they respond to each other in terms of turning and speed is exactly the same as the same fish in the physical environment. The data in the matrix is even cleaner because the tracking doesn't have to deal with occlusions. And so we really know that they believe this to be a conspecific, not just an object. They will habituate to an object. They will never habituate to a conspecific. And we've, we've shown this to be the case. So here you're seeing four individuals interacting, not in the same physical world, but in the same holographic world. And of course we can have virtual animals in there. So this allows us to do what we think of as a sort of, it's, it's inspired by the dynamical patch clamp in neuroscience. We can have our algorithm in the loop with the social system, like a dynamical social patch clamp. Uh, and because I started getting interested in the brain, um, I never thought I'd work on this little creature, but we started also developing virtual reality systems for Drosophila and also a virtual reality system for the desert locust. Um, and this is a large motion compensating sphere, the biggest sphere we could get through the door of the university. And as the animal moves, the sphere moves to keep it on top so it can move in a never ending environment. And this checkerboard is just calibrating. We of course give more naturalistic stimuli in our experiments. So there are many advantages, some of which I've hinted at. We have this high degree of control and we focus on tiny zebrafish that only use vision. They can't use the lateral line because of the, the viscous nature of water. That means that their lateral line is completely dominated by self-generated motion. We can easily quantify individual differences. We have a unique capability, as I hope to show you in a moment, into how the brain makes decisions because we can connect theory and experiment. We can do full parametric scans of parameter space. That's impossible in conventional experiments. And finally, we can control causality. If I'm influencing you and you're influencing me in a dynamic way, that's hard enough. What if there's a third individual? Are they influencing me directly or via you? What about a fourth or a fifth? Now we can control these networks for the first time. So I'll turn to this question of vectorial representation in the brain. And I just want to acknowledge the people that did all this hard work with me. Um, Vivek Sridhar did the Drosophila experiments and the numerical work. Liang Li did the fish experiments. Dan Gorbanos did the analytic work. Bianca Schell, an undergraduate, did the locust experiments. And all of this is a long-term collaboration with Nia Gov at the Weizmann, who um, is a theorist. And so we assume very simple interactions that's common to all of these brains, that there's reinforcement. 
excitation among neural ensembles that have similar preferences and long range or global inhibition. Now, you can think of this in a literal ring, like in the, the Drosophila brain, but in the mammalian brain, it's not a literal ring, but it's a functional ring. And some of you will know that there's been a long history of work on what are called neural ring attractor networks. And this is what we studied. And I won't go into the details of the model. We actually used a spin system model and we showed in the, in the supplement an analytic proof that the spin system model can be mapped to the classic neural ring attractor and vice versa. And it gave us some tools really for looking at things like neuronal noise. But the point I want to make here is that, um, why am I not going into the details? You know, surely the brain is very complicated. Well, I want to look at commonalities between different brains. And, you know, while there is this remarkable work increasingly looking into this, um, the anatomical structures, which is super important, um, and, you know, the details do matter, but at a certain level of description, when you put all these details together, like Ben did in this particular paper, you find that lots of them do not matter. They find that the ring attractor properties were highly robust to physiological details, such as synaptic weights. They said in their paper, the ring attractor computation is a robust output of the circuit, apparently arising from the network level properties rather than the fine scale details. Now that might be surprising to a biologist that works with these very detailed types of models, but speaking to someone from from um, complexity science or physics or mathematics, this may be less surprising because mathematical studies, which actually I've noted that are not really, they don't really cite each other very much. Certainly the mathematical studies don't get nearly as much attention as they should. They've already shown that attractive states of ring attractor networks can be described by a low level family of functions. Thus they can show that these details shouldn't and do not matter. And so because we're trying to reveal general principles and, and you know, look at commonalities. We look at the sort of simplest types of models. Um, and our model is also analytically tractable so we can better understand the dynamics. I won't go into too much detail there, but this turns out to be really important for what we're doing now, um, but that's kind of beyond, beyond today's talk. And of course, we can always add complexity at the cost of generality if we need to. But it's, I know it's a different kind of philosophy um, that some people take, but I really think that these simplified models can be very important. And of course, you know, if, they, if the predictions are not validated, we can make the models more complicated because we want to get at this very general question. You know, animals you know, of variety of complexities have to make decisions on the move. So is there a common algorithm to do so across tax and contexts? So we developed this model of the brain and it turns out it makes specific predictions. So if you look at two equal options, for example, so trying to see the bifurcation in the brain, indeed the, the neuronal model predicts that the animal will go the average direction until a critical point. And this critical point is termed the bifurcation in dynamical systems terms. It happens to be a literal bifurcation in, in physical space too, but when I mean bifurcation, I'm actually talking about a bifurcation in dynamical systems. And so let's go into this in a bit more detail. So if we look at our model, we can show that if an animal is far away from two options, two equal options, so represented by that little fly with the egocentric angle between the options being small because it's far, then the brain must come to a consensus between the options. But as the animal moves through space, it will hit this black line. And this black line indicates, we can prove then that the model will suddenly change to a decision between the options. And so the animal is moving through physical space. So this is now physical space moving towards two targets. We predict that the animal reach this critical point and then the brain will exhibit this dynamical phase transition and then make a decision. So to test this idea, I was amazed to look at the literature and I couldn't find a single paper where anyone had tracked an animal making such a decision. Biologists either tend to put animals on a T maze or a Y maze that enforces a geometric decision, or they put the animal in between the options, which later on I'll show you is a really bad idea. And so again, to reiterate, what we would predict is that the animal should move in between the options and we should see the spification in the brain via the trajectory. So we turn to our virtual reality with flies 
And there's hundreds of trajectories here, and the spectral plot just shows you the average of those. In the flies and in the locusts, as they're moving through physical space towards two targets, two static targets, you can clearly see evidence as predicted by the theory of a bifurcation in the brain. Now, this is important for two reasons. One is you know, it's useful to understand why and how animals should move through space. But anyone that's studied bifurcations will know or that, you know, or phase transitions, that there's universal properties close to a critical point. The most important one for today is what's called susceptibility or ultra sensitivity. So any system undergoing this type of transition will exhibit an emergent property whereby the system becomes ultra sensitive to any external inputs. This was first discovered in, in ferrous magnetic systems. You know, if the magnet is too cold and the particles are all aligned, it takes a strong magnetic force to switch the polarization of the magnet. Similarly, if the magnet's really hot and they're all disordered, it needs a lot of magnetic field to get them aligned. They're sort of it's like herding cats. But at the critical point, the system becomes incredibly sensitive to external fields. In the context of a neuronal system, it means that a relative neuronal activity in favor of one option becomes massively amplified near to and only near to this critical point. And this is an inevitable property. You do not, it's not like self, it's not like um, criticality in the brain where the system has to be tuned to a critical point. Any brain, because this is a geometric phase transition, any brain can undergo this transition. So it's, it's a different type of criticality than is typically thought of in neuroscience. And we also can show that the animal can come in from any angle towards these targets. And there's this curved manifold at which the brain will transition, uh, will reach this phase transition. And we've also shown that very small system sizes will exhibit a very nonlinear phase transition-like property, quasi-phase transition. So we know that our principles of decision-making, like the perceived difference between options is important. If it's easy to tell which is best or worst, you can make a decision more easily. If it's difficult to tell, you can integrate over time. But we argue that as a third previously undiscovered controlling for these, so these are both true, of course, but that the geometry really matters. And it matters a lot. We predict by about 35%. So no one would have thought if you have two options where the top one is slightly better than the other, that it would matter whether you put the animal in between the options or at the same distance over here. Our theory predicts a massive difference in decision-making because the brain here cannot go through a phase transition, whereas here it can. And so Lisa Ecker, an undergraduate student in the lab, tested this theory. So we made the decision very hard for locusts such that they only had a very slight preference for the, the well, a very difficult decision. They prefer the black option. And so just above 50% chance towards the preferred option. But for the, exactly the same decision, if you allow the brain to go through the bifurcation, it massively amplifies the difference as predicted by the theory. What about three options? Because in reality, animals are not just dealing with two options, they're dealing with many options. Now, many models in neuroscience just look at two. They find it difficult to scale to three. Well, when we look at three options now, this is just a schematic, of course, the animals are moving through much bigger space. We find that we predict the brain should exhibit now a double bifurcation. At the first bifurcation, it removes the leftmost, the rightmost option. And then at the second bifurcation, it chooses the best of the remaining two. And so the theory predicts if we're correct, the brain spontaneously breaks the world down into a series of binary decisions. We do not put this in the model. This is a spontaneous symmetry breaking property. And close to each critical bifurcation, the system becomes, in, again, emergent property, incredibly sensitive, like a supercomputer, sensitive to the differences between remaining options. What a wonderful thing for a small noisy brain to be able to do. And so now we needed an order of magnitude more data because we have a third option, but we were able to show both with the fruit flies and the locusts, indeed the brains exhibit the double bifurcation as predicted. What about more than three options? It turns out that the model works for any number of options. It works in three-dimensional space. It works in non-Euclidean space. I'll come back to that in a moment. 
and it works for any number of options. So it naturally scales to any uh, system size. So the animals will naturally turn complexity of the world into a repeated series of binary decisions for free as an emergent property. So I've argued that this may be a principle of decision-making, but I've looked at flies and locusts. They're not closely related evolutionarily, but they're both insects. Well, what if I take exactly the same model with exactly the same two parameters fitted to the locusts and the flies? By the way, they fitted exactly the same parameters, uh, which is not a coincidence, but I don't have time to talk into, uh, about that. But we take exactly the same model, don't touch it in any way. We apply it to a completely different evolved brain, a zebrafish brain. And not only do that, we, but we look at a different ecological context, one that's salient for zebrafish, which is schooling. So now instead of having two static targets that they're moving towards, here the real zebrafish is choosing between two moving targets, which are represented by these red zebrafish here. And we predict that by changing the lateral distance between these two stimulus fish that are moving through space, that the brain should exhibit this phase transition. Of course, we could never do this type of analysis using real animals, because I could never persuade two fish to swim exactly the same distance apart and get, you know, so it's amazing that we could just go through um, parameter space so effectively with this technology. And in doing so, we clearly find evidence that the brain exhibits this phase transition. With three options, it gets more complex, but what we're seeing here is a double phase transition, double, this double bifurcation. It looks a bit different here because of the moving frame of reference. And again, without the theory, how on earth would we even know what experiments to do? And if we did these experiments by chance, how on earth would we understand this type of crazy pattern that we actually see in reality? So it really shows the synthesis of theory and experiments and these new technologies is important for understanding the brain. One thing I won't talk about now, but our next paper, which I hope to submit this week, um, which we, we sort of touch upon in, in the previous paper, is that the only way we can explain our data for all of these systems is if the brain is representing space in a non-Euclidean way, that the neural representation must be non-Euclidean. We feel pretty certain about this. Um, and actually, Heinz Sompolinsky and others have predicted this in the past for other reasons. But we can, I just wanted to mention that we're, we're about to publish something that shows that really this, this non-Euclidean factor is really important. It allows the system to break out of infinite symmetry and infinite loops and really make very effective decisions, especially for three or higher numbers of options. Whereas a Euclidean brain will just get stuck in infinite bifurcations and infinite loops. Another aspect that might be interesting is um, working very closely with Armand Ball, who joined us from Harvard a couple of years ago, and he's an expert at whole brain imaging at cellular level resolution. And so we now have a fictive, well, by we, he has a fictive um, animal whereby the animal's paralyzed, but you can record what it's trying to do, and then you, it can, you can recreate that in virtual reality. So now we can have a zebrafish interacting in holographic virtual reality with, an, with other real fish, while also recording the neural dynamics. So we can really go from the neural uh, collective to the individual decisions to the collective decisions in the same preparation. Okay, if this is such a robust principle, then we should also find other evidence for it, such as in very complex, messy systems like wild primates. This is work I did with my PhD student, Ari Sprandrup Peskin, who's now a group leader here at the Max Planck, um, working with Damien Farine who's a uh, group leader in my department and is now um, got a, uh, I should have updated this, he's now got a faculty position in Australia, and Meg Crowfoot, who's co-director here. And so here we use GPS collars and accelerometers to get the locations of unhabituated wild baboons um, every second. Uh, and we did not put uh, collars on juveniles for ethical reasons. All of the collars were removed at the end of the experiment. But here we can see the colors just represent males, females, and subadults. Because in the literature, you know, it's, it's, they always say, oh, the dominant males are controlling the dynamics of the group. It's complete nonsense. It's a very egalitarian society when it comes to choosing where to go. But uh, we found tens of thousands of events where some individuals wanted to go one way, other individuals in a different direction, and yet they'll come to a consensus regarding where to go. So looking at the individual decisions, we asked whether you can see evidence of these bifurcations. 
if an individual baboon looks at two others that are going in different directions, indeed, we find evidence that there's this symmetric bifurcation. And if symmetry is broken, even by just one individual, then the baboon will choose the majority preferred direction. So this robust theory is even um, validated in, in nature with these wild primates. So overall, we find that there exists a, a common decision-making algorithm that governs decision or spatial decision-making within the brain. And natural selections find the same algorithm um, to coordinate between brains. Okay, in the last just two minutes, I just want to, for those of you who would, um, I, I just want to promote Constance for a little bit, what we've been doing in Constance. It's this beautiful city um, in Southern Germany. It was not bombed during the war because they left the lights on. It's on the border of Switzerland. So it's a very beautiful historic place. There was all, there was no behavior, not even undergraduate course when I arrived here. And it's a small modern reformed German university. It doesn't have the hierarchical structures of typical German universities. And also the government here really funds Blue Skies Research. And we want a major grant to have this integrative approach to bring together all of these different disciplines around the theme of collective behavior. Um, and so we have the Center for the Advanced Study of Collective Behavior, which we have um, funding for people to come and work with us across disciplines from neuronal decisions to, to decisions among animals. In addition, we're housed, you know, we've put these people together in the same building. So it's not like the biologists are in biology, the physicists are in physics and so on, like in a traditional university system. We have this beautiful new building we moved in last year. And this is just taken from my phone, but this is the view. So please do consider coming to, to visit us. We're 45 minutes direct train from Zurich airport. We also have this 15 by 15 by eight meter imaging hangar where you can track animals at sub millimeter precision, 500 Hertz, up to hundred, maybe 200 animals simultaneously. Um, Ahmed Al Hadi has just joined us from, from Princeton University uh, to study collective behavior in rats. He's a group leader now to study rats over uh, naturalistic length scales. We've tracked birds, including acoustic localization. We've got lots of technologies that we highlight in this paper that hopefully will come out. Um, Fumihiro Kana, we've recruited as a group leader who's looking at pigeons and visual field reconstruction. So lots of different technologies that I think, you know, it, it's a sort of mesoscale experiment where neuroscience could really play a key role. We've also developed new technologies for getting three-dimensional body postures from individuals, uh, a very wide variety of different animals. We've even done a recent experiment about five, five weeks ago, I think, where we looked at 10,000 locusts. And again, we can track them in real time, sub-millimeter precision in full 3D using 32 cameras. And we were able to reconstruct for the first time these moving bands of locusts, the formation of these spontaneous bands within the lab for the first time. And also looking at different properties where there's spatial attractors, looking at coupled oscillator systems, such as at the top here, you can see the locusts coupling with each other and making movement decisions together. This is time-lapse footage. If you're interested in this, Tom Scott is a YouTuber, got over 2 million views in one week with a video. We're also uh, recording from the brains of some of these animals in, in virtual reality. So you can have a look at that. But we also work in the fields, looking at the three-dimensional structure of the environment and tracking animals in these naturalistic environments using drones. Because when there's only 2,000 of these animals left in the world, you can't use GPS, you can't tranquilize the animals. And also, this is sped up so the little tails are flickering furiously. But these endangered zebra, you know, we can actually identify the individuals, we can get very detailed information, we can even track the ears, which gives us lots of data from equids about their emotional state. We're also utilizing it for tracking an ancient lineage of wolves, which again, we can track multiple individuals. And if we zoom in, we can get very detailed social data about how the animals are interacting with each other. And finally, I've, I've come back a few weeks ago from the Maldives, where we were um, looking at these vast fish schools against these coral sand. Um, it was not the hardest field work we've ever done. It was really, <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, looking at both inhabited and uninhabited islands. Um, and this is what we were studying. Um, these are sharks, black tip reef sharks, hunting within these groups. So we're getting highly quantitative data in natural environments. And using uh, these new segmentation and computer vision methods, uh, we can now 
track the motion of the sharks and get their body posture and do so for multiple individuals simultaneously. And if we look at these large groups, this is a time-lapse footage, inside each of these vacuoles is a different black tip reef shark. They highly coordinate their attacks. So uh, they're not asocial, they're highly social. And this is sped up and you can see the waves propagating across this uh, fish school. So we've got these multi-scale data that we're just starting to analyze. Um, so thanks very much for listening and I'd be very happy to take any questions.